Good morning. Southwest Writers is delighted to present John Gilstrap as our speaker this morning. He is a New York Times bestseller and a thriller award-winning author of over two dozen thrillers, praised by Publishers Weekly for his flawless characterizations. And today he's going to be talking to us about whose story are you telling? Choosing the correct point of view is one of the key elements of dramatic storytelling. In this session, John Gilstrap will walk you through the critical decisions that help you propel your story through the most dramatic set of eyes. Ah, okay. Um, fiction writers, present company included, don't understand very much about what they do. Not why it works when it's good, not why it doesn't when it's bad. I figured the shorter the book, the less the bullshit. Um, so the point I'm trying to make through, through this introduction is there are no rules in the writing business. You hear so much, and if, if you go on Facebook or, or you interact with other people, you can't start with the weather. You can't have a prologue. You can't do, you can't head hop. There, you, there's all these rules that don't exist. All you have to do is make them work, right? I mean, you, if, if it works on the page for you, um, then you've got a book. Who would have thought? I mean, Tom Clancy created the techno thriller. Um, God, the Harry Potter series, you know, all of that. Not especially, I love Harry Potter, not especially well written, I don't think, from the technical side, but in terms of storytelling, oh my God, it was, it was terrific. So as we go through these things, the next few minutes here, as, as, as I talk, remember that there are no rules, but there are some really, really, really good suggestions. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And I will occasionally slip into, you gotta do this, or it's important to do that. It's important for me to do it for my writing. It may not be important for you to do it for yours. One thing that I think is critical to remember in, in this writing biz is that writing is not about the writer. It's 100% about the reader. It's about convincing somebody to put down good money trusting you to take them on an adventure through, through characters who do interesting things in interesting ways in interesting places and give them an emotional ride at the same time. It's an oral and an aural art form. And it's also a visual art form. And when I talk about being a visual art form, again, this is me. My books have a lot of little paragraphs because my personal taste is if I open a book and it's got huge blocks of text, it doesn't matter what's in the text, I will be turned off of it. So the idea, remember that not only is it storytelling, it's also a product that people look at and they handle. So did I just say it's an oral art form? Yes, I did. Oral being what we hear. Reading, if you really think about it, it's kind of an impossible process. We, we start with spots on the page that we have all decided letters form words and words together form sentences, but there's reading legal papers and then there's reading engaging fiction. The difference between them for me is that in, in fiction, there are writers who can create this, the, the spots come together to form images and you actually forget the fact that you're reading spots on the page and instead you're watching the movie unfold in your head. That's a very deliberate process, I think, and it's, um, it's, and it's fragile. It's as fragile as word choice. Um, word choice counts beyond mere meaning. You watch for um, un alliteration in, um, oh, what was it? Hostage Zero, which was the second of my Jonathan Grave, second book in the Jonathan Grave series. The first sentence, I didn't catch it till the copy edits. Harvey Vaughn waited till dawn before going out to look at the body. Da 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 da, -da, -da and then he had a hot toddy. You know, I had sort of set up this, <laughs> I'd set up this rhythm for a limerick. And it was a first line in the book. And it, I just realized, oh my God, you can't do that. Uh, because people read aloud to themselves. At least, I think most people read aloud to themselves. So I changed his name to Rodriguez. Problem solved. <laughs> um, and, the, and the same rhyme and syntax, word flow, the, the, the rhythm 
of the language is important not only to sort of create, I'm very visual in my head about these things, it, it sort of create a, a, a soothing wave um, like the, the sea when, when, it, when it's working and, and it's, it's a, 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 there are calm scenes, the interstitial scenes, but then when the action starts, man, short sentences, one word paragraphs in some cases for me, because the, the rhythm of the words is the soundtrack of the book. So if you watch a movie, it's an interesting experiment. I did this once when I taught at the governor's school in, in Richmond. If you take a movie that's an action flick and then you put pastoral music to it, it really does change the movie. And then the soundtrack, we don't get the benefit of the soundtrack for our readers. We provide that through the heartbeat, literally the heartbeat of, of the words. Um, and you know, it's, it's about the reader, right? Nobody needs to know that you're smart enough to know what onomatopoeia means. Um, it sounds mildly dirty, but it, we all know it's not. There's no reason to, to you can say it sounds a lie or sounds like, right? Um, don't make your readers look for dictionaries. It breaks that magical process. You know, th this is a true story. When my wife reads my stuff, she's a very early reader, obviously. If she gets up, if she gets up to go to the bathroom or whatever, I will see if she's in the middle of a chapter. Going to the bathroom between chapters is fun. That's what chaptering is about. But if it's an exciting scene and she feels compelled either not to take it with her or can walk away in the middle of an exciting scene, there's something wrong with that scene. I broke the spell and it's always on me. Okay, this is where we're gonna start a hard switch into, into characterization. At one level, the plot of a story matters less than the voice with which the story is told. Um, if you think about To Kill a Mockingbird, one of my favorites, in honesty, not a lot happens in that book. It's, it's a coming of age story, it's a social justice story, but it's the voice of the story that really pulls us along. If you've read The Curious Case of the Dog in the Nighttime, which is a, a, the, the character, the, the narrator is autistic. And the, the narrative voice is so engaging that again, very little happens in the book in terms of, of plot, but you can't look away from it. So this business of voice, pulling the reader into the story and keeping them there has everything to do about your, with your choice of who's telling the story. The writing matters. You know, it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult, if not impossible, to sell first novels based on a pitch is because the story can be great, but if the voice isn't there, if you don't have that strong sense of character and that strong sense of narrative voice, the, the story's not, not going to flow. I don't know, I've heard various versions that there's only seven plots in the world or 15 plots in the world, whatever that is. The rest of it is all in the storytelling. And so what we're gonna talk about today for the rest of this day is the, the characterization part, which is a lot more than I, than I think most people think it is. We talk about the elements of storytelling being plot, setting, and character. And then we teach them, we learn them and we practice them separately. That's, you can't, because plot is obviously what drives a story. Setting and character can't be separated because the character has to interact with the setting in a way that the reader understands and can feel while driving forward the plot. So really what that means, plot setting and characters are interesting characters doing interesting things in interesting places. So if we start thinking of plot setting and characters as part of a knot, think of it as a rope, a cable, inter, inter, intertwined elements, um, you, you start the, the journey toward having a solid voice and having solid characters. Setting is, setting is interesting in the sense that everything happen, has to happen somewhere. Um, so, not only does the setting provide a sense of place, it provides a thing 
that the characters interact with. You know, we've, we've um, Travis McGee had his houseboat. You know, I've, my, my stories have Fisherman's Cove. There's the, um, it's the character's interpretation of their surroundings that's important. You know, if the one person walks into a, a museum and they, and they see history and lovely things and, and this is what the past looked like and somebody else right next to them sees a pile of bones that it's keeping him away from the football, right? The setting is the same place within your story, but we learn more, we learn about the character through the character's interpretation of the setting. Obviously setting provides plot points, you know, doors that open and close and, and creak and slam shut. The opportunities, we just talked about opportunities for characterization. One element, I threw this in, in terms of setting. If it's a real place, you better by God know it. You know, um, I've lived in Northern Virginia um, my whole life and my, my wandering areas, Virginia and Maryland and West Virginia and all that. So I know that really well. And I know the culture and I know the people and I know, you know, all that. Um, and I go to New York a lot, or I used to, you know, when times were normal. There is no way I would ever set a story in New York from the point of view of a New Yorker, because it's like a thousand different cities with neighborhoods and, and you know, different trains that go different places. And all. it's just, I would never do that. However, if I can send a Virginian to New York, I can pull that off because he can make mistakes and, and, and misinterpret things, right? Because He's not being, he's not purported by the writer to be something he's not. I hope this is making sense. This is where I tell you, if, if you've ever done one of these Zoom meetings, I guess we all have at one point, the hard part is not seeing the audience. You don't know, I call it the puppy dog stare when people get confused, they go. And <laughs> so, I, so I don't see that. And I, I hope there's not a lot of that out there. So creating characters without compelling characters, you don't have a story. You just don't have a story. I remember um, every year there, there's a thing called Thriller Fest in, in New York. Um, the International Thriller Writers Association goes in and, and they have a, a, a thing called Pitch Fest where writers can pitch their stories to agents. I think it's hell on earth, it has to be. You get like three minutes or five minutes to pitch your story and there are hundreds of other people doing it at the same time. I would rather eat glass, but. <laughs> I do, I participate in a thing called practice pitch fest where I pretend to be the agent and they come in and they pitch their stuff to me and I talk them off the ledge a little bit and help them focus. But what you hear people talk about a lot when it comes to their stories, I'm making this up on the fly, okay? Um, my story is about the financial crisis where China, stops doing this and then this country has another thing happen and then the the economy collapses then the war blows up or whatever no that's I, that could be the plot but the story is about how charlie jones and his family are trying to overcome the results of this thing that has befallen them because stories are not driven by plot. Stories are driven by characters doing interesting things in interesting ways in different in interesting places. They're not just pawns to advance the story. Characters are, for the reader, real people. You know, I find it's one of the great honors of doing what I do. I hear from Nathan's Run was the first book I wrote in 1995, I think, 96, it came out. And I still hear from readers now, of course, whatever happened to Nathan, who's a 12 year old boy in the story, whatever happened to him? Well, in reality, he never existed <laughs> and, he, and he disappeared, you know, at, at, the end, at the end of the story. And I would never say that to people because they're paying me the ultimate compliment that they're really concerned about this person who never really existed. That's your job is to create, and or to make somebody so hateable that you can't look away. Hannibal Lecter obviously comes to mind, I, I, I think for everybody, or the combination of the two. You have the two of them coming at each other. That's what characters are all about. 
And even if they're not human, they need to exude humanity. Watership down. Um, I don't know, I'm not a sci-fi kind of guy, but um, you know, it, it, people, readers need to identify with the emotions and the stresses and the happiness and the sadness of the characters they read about. That's what makes them real. And remember that every character always acts in his own best interest. Bad guys think they're good guys. I think good bad guys think they're bad. Good bad guys think they're good guys. They're doing a thing that makes sense to them to achieve their goals, which may be twisted and wrong, but that's not how they look at it. So bad guys are typically the weakest characters in stories because it's not really what the focus of the writer is. Um, in in Turney, he wants to talk about the, the, the good guys for the most part, spend a lot of time on the bad guys, particularly if they're point of view characters. So who's gonna tell the story? We all know first person, third person. So this, this, this presentation is designed for, I think a less advanced class than what we have working here. So I'm gonna breeze, breeze through this uh, fairly quickly. First person is considered to be, by many to be the most empathetic point of view. Um, a lot of uh, private eye fiction is written in the first person. I walked into the room and I saw that. And, and, and you feel and see everything through the eyes of the first person character. I disagree. I think that the first person character eliminates too much tension. You know, the one thing we know, if I'm telling a story in first person past tense, the audience knows I make it through because I live long enough to, and I, again, I write thrillers. I live long enough to be able to write the story. So therefore that pot element is taken out of, uh, out of contention. Um, I think it's limiting in terms of action. If, if it's first person writing, true first person, you don't know what the bad guy's doing until the good guy sees him. But I think there's a lot of drama in putting the two forces together with a good guy and a bad guy. The reader sees it. The reader sees the trains coming at each other, but the, the individual characters don't. And I think it's first person is really much better suited to mysteries than it is to thrillers. Third person for me is, is, is the opposite of that. Um, it allows greater flexibility of action. I can have, uh, and this again goes back to the lessons I learned from um, the day of the jackal. You can have, the, well, and it's weird because the good guy is actually the assassin, the, the way this thing is written. So we see him sneaking up and he's, going to, and, he, and he's going to shoot somebody and then you cut the scene and then you go to another character's point of view. So maybe not even interacting with him. So now we've got another storyline that keeps the reader turning the pages because they want to go back to see the continuation of that scene. I cheat sometimes in my reading where if it's too tense, I say, okay, I'll go ahead and I'll finish chapter 15, I'll skip chapter 16, see what actually happens in chapter 17 to my good guy, and then I'll go back and read chapter 16. But to, to build that kind of anxiety and, and pressure within the reader, I think, is, is, is wonderful. The reader technically never knows in third person if the, if the character survives. Um, if it's a series character that pays the bills, there's a really good chance that the character is going to survive, but there's plausible deniability. Um, third person if it's done well, is multiple. It's like writing first person, that intensity and, and internal knowledge, but with each point of view character. So it can, be, it can be more, I guess it can be more complicated. I just naturally go that way in my storytelling. Um, it's interesting, I write a lot of short stories in first person, but novels are all in third person. And I don't know why. Um, but I think, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but whoever is, uh, was talking about the, the seminar that's coming up on, on characterization, that, yeah, you really should be able to tell through dialogue or even thought processes um, which character is, is doing their thing um, because they have been, they've been drawn that clearly as different people. Okay, go through this pretty quickly. If you think about it, all right, I'm gonna take a different tack on this than what's, what's on your screen. Um, J.K. Rowling didn't write it in first person because it's Harry's story. And if you're familiar with the Harry Potter 
milieu, um, you know that there's one character, spoiler alert, plug your ears, we all know that the presumed, presumptive bad guy, Snape, turns out to be a good guy. Well, if the stories had been told from Snape's point of view, there'd have been no story. It would have been a short story, one and done. But because of Rowling's choices on how she made Harry the center of every scene, one way or the other, she varied from it some at the end, but by making Harry the, the, the point of view character, um, we could know things about Harry because we're in his head that he doesn't necessarily share with other people. And I think it's nice when um, readers know something about a character that, that the other characters don't know. All right, I talk about camera placement as um, imagine each character if can only see when you're in that character's point of view, can only see what he sees and what he feels. So if I say something, if, if I'm the character, okay, so John the character says something to Mary the character, I can't say in that, in, in, in that third person narration, he hurt her feelings because he doesn't know if he can't, he doesn't feel her feelings. He can see that her, Tears, you know, her eyes got red. He can see that, you know, she she looked offended, but he can't say that he hurt her feelings because that's something he doesn't know. It's not within his camera. And the camera is, is what he sees and, and feels and hears. Um, you really have to know who your characters are, whether it's first person or third person, whatever it is you're doing, you need to know your characters. How do they react to things? I personally, I, I don't believe in writing character biographies. I've never done that. I think it's kind of BS. I think it's, it, it probably works for other people and, and that's great. For me, the voyage of discovery is to figure out why people are doing th things. I mean, Jonathan Grave, that, that series was about a freelance hostage rescue specialist. He's former Delta operator and all this. And like all writers writing under deadline, sometimes I put myself into a corner and think, oh, I probably shouldn't have had him do that but I can't go back. I don't have time to go back and rewrite four chapters. So I go, all right, how would he get out? Let's figure it out. And because I know his character and his capabilities, and he, you know, there's a lot of MacGyver in him too. Um, there, there's, there's always a way, but you have to know your characters. If you don't know how your characters are going to react to something, then the, the reader is already not bonded with the character, if that makes sense. Um, and know how the characters serve the story. I think one of the problems with um, new writers is a lot of utility characters, people who walk on to, you know, it's, I found the gun and then walks off stage. You know, it's, it's it, readers understand when writers are writing for themselves, when writers are it's important that that character be there because it's the only way the writer could figure out how to make the scene work. Yeah, you know, it's, it, I guess it's organic. Characters, even the, the minor ones, I think should be organic to the story that's being told. All right, the narrative prose, this is where we're getting to voice, needs to be consistent with your chosen POV. Children don't use big words. They can be very world wary, but they don't use big words. Or if they do use big words, then develop that as, as a plot point. You know, but one of the problems I think with adults writing, particularly adults of, of my era, writing about children of this era, um, it's easy not to resonate because so much has changed in the world. Everything from um, you know, when I was a kid, bullying was solved by a fight in a schoolyard and it was done. Now, God, you know, you got all the cyber stuff and all this that is beyond my understanding, you know? So I, I know that I have to be very careful if, if I go, if I have a point of view character, I can have adults observing children all day long. But if I'm gonna have a child as a point of view character, I'm entering the space that's a little bit wishy and I have to be careful. Nuns don't cuss. I don't know if that's true or not, but the point is, you know, for the, the you, you need to make whoever your character is should resonate as real with the reader. 
Um, so the elements of storytelling, plot, setting, and character are, are, are not separate things. They're completely intertwined and they all serve each other. Now, what I'm gonna do here, I think, okay, here's example one. We are um, in this, I'm, I'm describing a desert, a desert landscape from a character, we'll call him Charlie, I don't know what I, I named him in here, probably Charlie, because that's my go-to name, um, from a character's point of view. Bob pushed the door open and climbed out into the brilliant sunshine. Shielding his eyes, he scanned the horizon. The beauty of the place took his breath away. Rock formations glistened in shades of copper, gold, and bronze. The vegetation, while sparse, seemed to vibrate with intense reds and blues and yellows. He was stranded in an artist's paradise. One description of the place. Same place. Opening the car door was like, like opening a blast furnace. Superheated air hit him with what felt like a physical blow. The desiccated ground cracked under his feet as he stood. As he took in scrub growth in the rocky horizon, he understood that he, was no, that he no longer rested at the top of the food chain. Now he understood why we tested nukes in places like this. So by describing the place, we're setting the place for the reader who will know they're in the desert, but depending on which way we go, we know something more about the point of view of the character. Um, I did spend a lot of time blowing shit up in the desert. So my, that second one, example two, comes a little bit closer to, uh, to my version of the desert only because of where I was. Um, but you know, beautiful desert night is a beautiful desert night. Um, beautiful desert day, not in August is, is beautiful as well. So the narrative must, there it is, right? There are no rules. Narrative, narrative must reinforce the point of view. So here's two examples. This would be a writing, uh, a writing exercise in a, in a different circumstance. The scene, like the omniscient scene, at midnight, a 13-year-old boy steps out of the back door of a bar in a bad neighborhood and lights a cigarette. That's the scene. All right. Why is he lighting the cigarette? I don't know. It could be it's a signal to a bad guy or it's a signal to a good guy. or it's a, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, but in writing that scene, if the boy took a pull on the cigarette and he choked, we'd know something. If he let it go into his lungs and it felt great, we'd know something else. If his hands were wet and, the, in the, and he had a dish towel because he'd been washing dishes, we know that he's a hardworking kid. If he's got somebody's wallet in his hand, we know that he's a different kind of kid. So when, if, if that scene is important to the plot, how you tell that scene is important to the reader because they now know stuff that they otherwise wouldn't know. Another one would be a woman walks to the mailbox at the end of her driveway, opens a letter and starts to cry. Well, all right. She just got into the university of her choice and she's really happy. She just got noticed that her husband had been killed in action and very sad. Um, there's that thing, that mailbox scene by itself is just a mailbox scene. It's when we hang the emotion on it and we have characters interact with their scenery. That's when we have a story. And this is, and we also have a voice. You know, the more you get to know that character's point of view, worldview, and and vocabulary, and kind of kind of attitude, that's when you know that you're 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 in the slot. That's when you know that you're really telling a good story, and. And it, that description, that should be different, um, I think, no rules, that that description should be different than it would be if it was told from somebody else. That's, you know, the difference between, I don't know how many people have kids, but you know, the, the difference between the, the adults interacting with Christmas and children interacting with Christmas, they're symbiotic, um, I think there's equally happy, but the experience 
of that day and the buildup is entirely different. And, and that's what makes this whose story are you telling so important. Um, I once wrote it in um, At All Costs. There's a story, <clears throat> there's a 13 year old boy who's being attacked by a bad guy in a hospital bed. And he can't move, he's intubated and all this kind of stuff. And I, for whatever reason, I decided it was good to tell this from the point of view of the bad guy, because I wanted to show how bad a bad guy he was. The scene didn't work. And then I rewrote it, the other same, absolutely the same events from the 13 year old's point of view who can't move and can't do stuff. It becomes an entirely different scene that takes the plot to exactly the same point. So choose carefully. All right, the whole backstory and personal baggage thing. You know, there are, Jonathan Grave, I am 14 books. Just finished the 15th book in the series. And the reader knows that Jonathan and, and Boxers, his buddy, left the army three years before retirement and they weren't happy about it. I know why it happened, but there has never once in all those books been a convenient place to develop that plot point. So I don't develop the plot point. They, the reader knows what I think they need to know and what they know then justifies and motivates what the characters do, but they don't know the, de they need to know the details because those deep backstory stops the front story, like by definition, right? So as, as soon as you stop, people are engaged in what's going on, but as soon as you stop to explain something that's not important, you've broken the spell. And that's, that's, that's the worst sin. Reveal backstory judiciously. Keep it relevant to the story that you're telling. That's what I was just saying about their past. And be subtle and graceful and, and don't show off. You know, if it's not, if writing is about the reader. It's not about the writer. Um, you don't have to show, you've done a lot of research and a lot of it should never be on the page just because it's not relevant to the story. You know, it helps to have an idea of where you're going before you begin, which is, you know, who wins, who loses, who lives, who dies. For me, what's really important is how do I want the reader to feel at the end? Do I want them to be a little bit teary? Do I want them to be jumping up and down? Yes, we got them. Um, and different books go different ways, but the subtlety that's necessary and the sensitivity you need to build into the character in the reader's head, those are entirely different approaches. Um, the, um, I don't, I, I'm a movie guy, I really enjoy movies and Apollo 13 is one of my favorites. I think it's one of the most quotable movies ever, ever made. And at the very end of that, you have Gene Krantz, who's the flight director played by um, uh, Harris, the, anyway, Ed Harris. Um, when the good guys finally come down, everybody's jumping up and down and, and cheers, and he just quietly sits down. There's so much told in that moment, and it's very emotional, but it's been earned through the entire movie. The, that last moment, the last time we see your character, whatever it is you want us to feel has to have been earned over the previous couple hundred pages. And that's, all of these elements I've talked about, there's a, there's a lot here to, to go into you know, 40 minutes, but, but all of that, that's, that's the cable, that's the rope of all of these different parts of the story interacting with each other. And these are decisions that have to be made for every single scene. Who does the scene belong to? Why is the scene there? What is the beginning and end of the scene? Where does a scene break? What's all, all of it? going through the engineered product of a book, which is designed exclusively in why I write commercial fiction, exclusively toward giving the reader the best reading experience you possibly can. And that's the importance of character and choosing who your characters is, is going to be. Um, I, th I throw in this thing about outlining because a lot of people do it. I used to do it. I don't do it anymore. Um, I know the ending kind of, sort of. I know the beginning and the middle and, and where it's going to go. But I actually en enjoy the voyage of discovery. But that's me. Uh, one of my dear friends, Jeffrey Deaver, does like 60 page, one you know, single page outlines. And he can jump 
in a first draft, he can jump from chapter two and then write chapter 30 because he knows everything that's gonna happen in between. That ain't me. Um, discover your process. There are no rules. What works for some people don't work for others. Um, the, um, and don't, don't be afraid to challenge what, what you've been told. I, I said early on, I took one creative writing class and he just didn't get it. He didn't get what I was trying to do. And it took me a, lot, a while to understand and to you know, heal the bruised ego from some stuff that he said to me. Um, but um, this, this is your journey and it's, it, it has to work for you, your way, understanding that there are no rules, but there are some pretty good suggestions.